Good morning. Maybe it's the weather. Everybody seems more sleepy today. Maybe it's an anticipation of Thanksgiving coming, right? You're storing, you're, you're reserving your, your energy for all that food you're going to have to digest. <clears throat> all right. Well, let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful to be here this morning and be in your word. Lord, I pray that uh, through your Holy Spirit, you would work in our hearts and our minds from your scripture this morning, that we would hear it and understand it and be convicted to apply these truths to our lives. We thank you that that is what you want to happen in our lives. And I pray that we desire that and continually go to you for guidance and for help that we might grow from your word, from the truth of your word, and grow more into your son's likeness, our perfect example of how to live on this earth. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We thank you for this time this morning to be in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Story that took place clear back in 1990, just a few years ago. Uh, a fellow, true story by the way, a fellow robbed a, a bank up in Canada and uh, walked away with a whole whopping $6,000. I realize that was worth a little more back then, but still and yet, that's not much. And he got caught. And to make matters worse, the gun that he used to carry out the bank robbery was a uh, 45 Colt semi-automatic made by the Ross Rifle Company in Quebec, Canada in 1918, and it was worth $100,000. <laughs> Do you know what you already have? <laughs> and how often do we spend time grasping for things that have such little value in comparison to what we already have. Contentment. What is true biblical contentment? And are we living that out? Well, let's find out. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning. We're going to look at verses 6 through 10 as we work our way through this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, who's at Ephesus. They're acting as pastor, dealing with many issues. So Paul's addressing a lot of different stuff, stuff that he wants Timothy to deal with, things that he wants him to teach and preach. And in verse 6, we're kind of, it's a bit of a, a, a transitional verse. Uh, Paul's still continuing on the same vein of thinking. Uh, so when he says in verse 6, but godliness actually is a means of great gain, we have to look back just a little bit. So if you remember, he's talking about, up, starting him up at verse 3, uh, if anyone advocates a different doctrine. So essentially false teachers. Uh, and he goes on to talk about them. And one of the things that he says uh, at, there at the end of verse 3, and the doctrine conforming to godliness as being one of the things that they reject. In other words, doctrine should lead to true godliness. <clears throat> but then he says at the end of verse 5, who supposed, talking about these men, who supposed that godliness is a means of gain? And now he's talking about financial gain. Uh, you know, like, oh, if I'm, a, if I'm a, a highfalutin pastor or teacher and I can become well-known and I can make a lot of money and now all of a sudden it becomes a money-making game rather than, no, the purpose of a preacher, a pastor, an evangelist, uh, those in ministry is to spread the word of God and to make disciples. So their motive is wrong. But then Paul says in verse 6, but godliness actually is a means of great gain, but not financial gain. At least it should not be. <clears throat> in other words, godliness can only have great gain if it's accompanied with, what does he say? But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied with contentment. Contentment. 
we want a godly life, one of the things that has to be there is contentment. Why? Well, Matthew 6, excuse me, Matthew 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So that's what he's talking about. Cannot serve wealth or the world and the things of the world. Now, I realize we live in the world. The Bible teaches much about how do we live in this world. But to serve the things of this world, to have it consume us, we cannot do that and serve God. The two don't mix. They don't work together. So I think it... Begs a little bit of a question, though, as we get into this. We're going to talk in further detail about all this. But is it sinful to be wealthy, then? Is having wealth sinful? The short answer is no. In fact, we see many examples in Scripture, just to name a couple, Job, Abraham, of individuals who were very, very godly men that had great wealth. Now, that's not a justification to go, oh, good, then I'm on the right path. I'm, I'm, on, I'm after wealth, so I'm on, I'm on an okay path. No, that's not right either. But having wealth in and of itself is not sinful. It's how did we accomplish it, and what are we doing with it is the real question. So it's not sinful, but the odds aren't real good according to Scripture. Because Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 and 24 says, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, Now this is in response to his disciples after the rich young ruler, which we'll talk a little bit more about him in a bit. Uh, Jesus says, talking to his disciples, says, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So you might ask yourself, why is this so difficult? Well, Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And quite often, those who are very wealthy have pursued that. And they've gone after that, and they've become consumed by it. Just like the rich young ruler, they become so consumed by it that Again, they find themselves in a situation of, you cannot serve two masters. So they choose to serve wealth. So Jesus says it's very difficult because a person who is rich doesn't necessarily, though he asks the rich young ruler to do this, doesn't necessarily, when they become saved, have to get rid of all of that wealth. But they do have to give it all over to the Lord. And it has to no longer be master in their life. Now all of a sudden, oh God, this is a tool that you have allowed me to have and use and be a good steward of for the Lord, and now I want to glorify you with it. That's a far cry from a worldly person who is consumed by their wealth. So godliness is a means of great gain when it is accompanied by contentment. We can't experience true godliness without contentment. And and hopefully by the time we get done with this message, you understand why. Contentment is such a key component of the Christian life because it is solely based and founded on trust in God. Look at verse 7. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. You heard the saying, he who dies with the most toys wins. Is that not the most foolish thing you've ever seen or heard? And then you've heard the other flip side of that, and he who dies with the most toys still dies. Yeah, well, because of this truth. We, We bring nothing into this world, and we leave with nothing from this world. Let's turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, let's start at verse 34.
And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to deny yourself, that is realizing you're a sinner in need of a Savior, and a willingness to let loose the grip of the world, take up your cross with humility, follow Christ, Verse 35, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? How would you answer that question? What would you give in exchange for your soul? Anything? All the pleasures this world has to offer? Millions of dollars? Billions of dollars? Absolute power and control of everything? What is your flesh desire? Would you trade? Would you take that in exchange for giving up your soul? Maybe just a silly illustration example I thought of is I, I enjoy gardening. I enjoy all kinds of agriculture and gardening is one of them. And uh, Imagine, I know this really isn't the time of year for this, but imagine you went out to the garden in the spring, and you had all your seed, and uh, particularly, let's, let's just use pumpkin seeds as an example, and uh, you know, you're growing pumpkins because you're planning to have them through the winter and be able to eat them and all that sort of thing. We do that. And uh, you get out to the garden, and you know, you're like, oh, it's a nice sunny day. I think I'll sit down. You take a little break before you plant your seed, and as you're sitting there, you start snacking on them. I had to pick a seed that wasn't like, you know, toxic or something, pumpkin seeds. And you start snacking on them. And like, oh, I guess I'll go plant now. Oh, whoops, ha, I got nothing left to plant. Oh, well, that'd be like really poor, poor planning. We as believers need to be good planners in the sense that what is this life compared to all of eternity? What are we supposed to be doing here in light of eternity? And I'll tell you something, it's not living for the moment. It's not being as, as happy and as satisfied in the worldly sense as I can be now. I, after all, I mean, in large part, is that not the American dream? What we ought to be doing is planting the seeds rather than eating them so that we have a harvest later. That is entering into heaven with a well-done, good, and faithful servant. We ought to be planning ahead, living our life for the future, not for the moment. I want to read verse 7 again back in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and then I want us to turn to Job. So it says, For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Job understood this really well. Let's turn to Job chapter 1. Job had a lot of wealth. And this was back in the day when they measured wealth by the amount of animals and servants and all that kind of thing that you had. He had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camel and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 female donkeys and very many servants. Very, very wealthy man. But he was also blameless and upright. And in chapter 1, verse starting at 21, because if you remember the story of Job, God allowed Satan to, at this point to have taken essentially everything from him but his health at this point. And that, the taking the health away was coming, coming after this. After everything was taken away from him, verse 21, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Job understood this principle, this principle that we see that Paul writes about many, many years later to Timothy. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we, can take nothing, take, we cannot take anything out of it either. We can't take anything with us. 
tangible, material-wise. So building up wealth here has very little value for eternity. But what can we take with us? What can we take with us out of this world? Let's, let's talk about that and then let's balance that with, with material things. Okay, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, let's start at verse 19. Jesus makes it very clear here. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. In other words, all the tangible things that this world has to offer, they're not going to last forever. They're going to they're going to degrade, and we see that all the time. Things degrade. Things break down. And ultimately, in the end, everything's going to burn anyways. Verse 20, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. And look at this, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what's the answer? Get rid of all of your stuff and store up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Well, maybe God will call you to do that. But maybe he wants you to learn how to take what he's given you and use it to build up treasures in heaven. Use it for his glory. Use it to, as God has blessed you, to bless others with what God's blessed you with, and, and use it for ministry purpose, and use it to glorify Him in how you utilize what He's given you. Because material things can create eternal value to them if we're using them to glorify the Lord. So don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And remember... Read verse 21 again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Ask yourself that question. Where is my treasure? Because where your treasure is, what you desire, what you, you deem is most valuable to you, that's where your heart is. <clears throat> the plaque across the stairway going downstairs, what you have at the center of your attention is what has you. So be careful, be very careful what you have at the center of your attention. Back to 1 Timothy, verse 8. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. So what is biblical contentment? Or better yet, what is the secret to contentment? Turn to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. Now, everybody knows the verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know the context of that verse. Well, this is the context. Verse 11, Paul writing to the church at Philippi says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering. In other words, this is the secret to contentment. Bottle this up and pass it on to the next person. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What's at the heart and core of that verse? Trust. In God. I can do all things. Now it's not talking about 
I can, I can climb that mountain, or I can, I can beat this person in a, in a competition. Or, it's not talking about those kind of things. This is talking about contentment. I can, I can deal with good circumstances. I can deal with hard circumstances. And I can be content through all of that. Why? Because it is Christ who gives me strength. I trust Him to do whatever it is He wills in my life. Do we trust God to all the way to the core? And when things do really get hard, we trust that He is good? Though the circumstance might not be good, the situation might not be good, people involved in that situation might not be good, but God is good. And He wants to grow me up, and He wants to stretch me, and He wants to strengthen me, and sometimes that means going through trials, going through persecution, dealing with difficult things, maybe being financially destitute for a time could be part of that. Do I trust Him that He will give me the strength to get through that and He has good purpose in allowing it to happen and what the outcome is going to be and can I trust Him in that? That's when contentment really starts to come in by itself at that point. Because the core is not, well, I just need to be okay with what I have. Okay, uh, grip my teeth and go through it. It's, well, it's at the core of what the word means. Contentment, the the word in the Greek behind this, literally means self-sufficient. Now, don't take that the wrong way, because in our culture, we think of self-sufficient of like, oh, I just do everything myself, and I don't need anybody's help. No, it's talking about self-sufficiency in that I am, I, I am sufficient because of the Lord, ultimately, and I have what I need. I don't need, I don't long for more. I am, I am satisfied with what I have because I trust the Lord, and He has given me what I need in the moment to get through. Self-sufficiency, in that sense, is contentment. I want to balance this just a little bit. So let's turn to James chapter 4. It's always important to bring biblical balance into these things when we're talking about them. Because we could take this to the extreme and go, well, then I'd, I'll, just, I'll just sit here and I'll be, I need to just not even think beyond what I have. And is that right either? So look at the attitude that we see in James chapter 4. Look at verses, starting at verse 13. Look at 13 through 16. James says, Come now you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, so here's the solution. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Verse 15, look at what that's saying. If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or do that. So, is it wrong to make plans? Or is it wrong to go, you know... It would sure be nice, and I'm, I'm not serious here, it would sure be nice to upgrade this old water bottle. You know, it's got an awful lot of dents on it. Maybe I would like to upgrade this. And you make a plan to do that. And it makes sense to do that, and, and it's reasonable, and there's a practical purpose to it, opposed to your guys' water bottles are an awful lot nicer than mine. And now I feel bad about mine. Now I got to go because I, I thought this one was fine, but now I've seen yours, and, and now yours all of a sudden, I got to have that one. See the attitude difference that is there? So as we make plans, we need to make sure that, that one, we have practical biblical thinking in the plans that we make. And we need to also remember that though we may plan our ways, who is it that directs our steps? The Lord directs our steps. And that's what we want. So we make 
we exercise good wisdom, we use good discernment, and we seek the Lord for guidance, and we make plans based on that, and bring it in godly counsel, and what does God's word say, and all of that. We make good plans, but ultimately we make those plans with, with a loose grip. We don't have a tight grip on them, a grip of pride and arrogance, and this is what I'm going to do, and nothing and nobody's going to stop me from doing it. I will have what I want. Opposed to, I'm going to make good, godly, biblical plans, and I'm going to trust the Lord that He's either going to provide for that to happen if it's His will, or I'm going to trust Him even if He shuts that down and it doesn't happen like I want it to happen, or it doesn't happen in the time frame that I want it to happen. Are we okay with that? Are we content? Are we satisfied in being self-sufficient in the sense that I am, I am satisfied with what and where God has me, even if I can see a better way? and a better situation. But can we be content and satisfied with where God has us? Because He has purpose in it. The last thing we want to do is rush the Lord and His plans. God, this old car's driving me crazy. I can't deal with it anymore. What if God wants you to keep dealing with it for a while longer? Can you trust Him and trust Him to provide through it? Back to 1 Timothy. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Verse 9. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. You ever wanted to get rich? You ever, you ever thought about, boy, if I won the lottery, what would I do with that? Hmm. I'm going to tell you right now, the only way I'm going to win the lottery is if I pick a, a ticket up off the sidewalk because I think it's trash, and somebody goes, that's the winning lottery ticket and it's yours, and I would go, I don't know if I want that. I hope you don't long for riches. I hope it's not a, a, a goal in your life that someday your answer to, to poverty is winning the lottery or, or striking it big at the casino or something like that. Now, if you're sitting out there this morning, oh, now, come on, is it really that big of, you know, those lotteries, they support, you know, good causes and, and you know, casino, they can just be, be just fun and games if you want them to. You can come talk afterwards and I'll give you some further reasons why, uh, even with those arguments, I still think they're terrible ideas and, and don't have any good biblical basis for why we would go do that. Especially when at the heart and core of these things is their money made is made on people who are desiring to get rich. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now, it's not wrong to have ideas of how to make money. God blesses some people to have the gift to know how to do that kind of thing. And if it's kept in line of Scripture, it can be okay. But it needs to be accompanied with contentment. And it needs to be an attitude of, okay, God, you know, through honest means, you've allowed me to make wealth, and I'm going to use that to glorify you, not serve myself. Because what often we do if we come along with some money, and what do we do with it? Oh, goody, I can now go buy this thing and that thing, and here comes the... The, the new widescreen TV and the surround sound system and the new car and the, what do we do with it? I'm not saying all those purchases are wrong. I'm just saying what is our heart? What is our attitude behind it? Because at the heart, the corrupt heart of man, at the flesh, is greed. We like those things. We think that there's going to be self-satisfaction in them. That's why people play the lottery. But look at those people and look at what became of their lives. You take someone who's been, let's say, living in poverty, and they get that winning hundred and whatever million dollar lottery ticket, and all of a sudden they're wealthy. Well, they get a thing called SWS. It's called Sudden Wealth Syndrome. <clears throat> Apparently it's a real thing. 
And it's people who all of a sudden get wealthy and they lose it. They don't know how to handle themselves anymore. And they think all of their answers are going to be in buying this and buying that. And I can tell you right now, none of the most important answers in life are found through money. But do we really think that? We often think that that's what's going to solve all our problems. We need to reverse that thinking. You look at people like win the lottery. People, uh, college students, you know, come straight out of college and get signed on to professional sports and get a signing bonus of millions of dollars. Many of them get into drugs and all kinds of issues as a result of that. Or a huge inheritance. Waiting for that, that distant uncle that you don't even know exists to die and leave you with a whole bunch of money? I wouldn't count on it. Don't even look forward to that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. That just sounds wonderful, doesn't it? You, you want to get rich so that you can be this. Here, many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. That's, that's the path that you see in the world. When people want to get rich and then all of a sudden something happens and they do become rich, this is the norm. We should want to, want to keep away from that. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, look at verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> what gate are you going through? Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So the wide gate, the gate that the majority of the world is going through, is, the, is broad and it leads to destruction. That's the last path we want to be on. And as believers, that's the last path we should be thinking about. We are not of the world anymore. <clears throat> so we need to... Through the help of the Holy Spirit and time in His Word and growth, we need to retrain ourselves. We need to have our minds renewed. We need to go through a metamorphosis process, completely changed, to stop thinking about the ways of the world and start thinking about the ways of God. The, the ways, the, 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 the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And are we living with that in mind, as in versus living in the moment, are we living eternally minded? Are we living with our binoculars on, looking ahead at where we're going? <clears throat> or are we living like one step in front of us? We need to look up is what it comes down to. You ever been hiking, particularly on a, on a mountain trail where there's a lot of obstacles, and you ever find yourself just staring at your feet for the longest time and you're hiking along and then all of a sudden somebody goes oh man look at the view of the mountainside over there and you look up and you're like how long have I been hiking and that's been there and I haven't even been paying attention because I've been looking at my feet you know you're watching where you're going and there's a place to do that but we need to watch where we're going looking up at the same time paying attention to where we're going looking ahead we need to look up look forward look into the future that God has revealed to us, and look at the hope that we have, and live with that in mind. We need to do this. Matthew 6, 33. If you're still in Matthew 7, this is really close. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. That's the life that we need to live. Seeking first that, as of most importance, and this is in the context of material things. You see, Jesus is saying, don't worry about all this other stuff. 
Don't fret over it. Don't become consumed by it. Don't let it become the center of your attention. It doesn't mean don't pay any attention to it. There, there we are uh, commanded in Scripture to, to provide and provide for our families. And, but that provision is immediately coupled with trusting God for provision and keeping priorities first and foremost of verse 33, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. If we're doing that, and then we're trusting God for provision, doing our part along the way, and all these things will be added to you. God wants to provide. And He will provide your needs, or He'll give you the grace to get through it. But we need to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness through all of that, all these things will be added to you. Back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. We fall into temptation. That means give in to it. And a snare, it only leads to to this. Foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. And we get to the real heart of the issue in verse 10. For the love of money. In the Greek, the word there for the love of money, a compound word in the Greek that literally means affection for silver. A love for silver, an affection for silver. This is a tight grip to get loose from. The love of money. The example that we see of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, how do I gain eternal life? What do I need to do? And Jesus goes through a few things with them, and then it comes down to this. This is, comes out of Luke chapter 18, verses, this is verses 22 and 23. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Now Jesus knew his heart. One thing you still lack. Because he knew that he had a tight grip on his desire, his love of what he had, his love of money. <laughs> Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus isn't calling all of us to just go off and sell everything we have and give it to the poor. And then the poor would have it all, and they'd be rich, and then we'd be poor, and they'd have to give it back to us, and we'd just go back and forth. So that doesn't make any sense. But Jesus knows the heart of this man, and he knows that he has a grip on what he has. He loves it. He wants it. He's unwilling to let go of it. If Jesus came to you and said for you specifically, I want you to sell all that you have, and Jesus is standing before you in person, just like he is to, at the rich young ruler, and says, come be a follower of me. What would you do? Oh, I, I don't know about this. The rest of Jesus' disciples, they did that. They dropped what they're doing and went and followed Christ once they saw and realized that he was the Messiah. There is nothing more important than being a follower of Christ and doing God's will. If he's asking you to do something like that, are you willing to do that? If, if God asked you to uproot and move to another country to be a missionary and he was absolutely clear that's what he wanted you to do, would you be willing to do that? The, the point is just that. Are we willing to trust God? That what he wants us to do, that we're willing to do that? Because... Not just because, but because he wants what's best for us. And he is good. And the best and safest place to be is in the center of God's will. That if we reject God's will in our lives and we pursue our own thing, we are only bringing misery upon ourselves. And we're going down that path of destruction, giving in to temptation. The love of money. We need to let loose of that grip. Pry our fingers off of it. 
For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. All sorts of evil. And it doesn't even mean that you have it, the money, that is. The love of money can be there and you not even have it. If you don't have it, it just leads to discontentment. I love money, but I don't have it, and I don't understand why other people have it, and I want what they have, or I'm just going to be angry at those who have it. That's another, another uh, uh, outpouring of covetousness, is have an attitude towards people who do have it, judging them that because they have it, they must be wrong and they must be in sin. We need to be very careful with that. Uh, and if we do have it, it just, and we have the love of money, it leads to self-indulgence. Look at, look at wealthy people. You know, have you, you ever worked for a wealthy person or observed a wealthy person? Particularly, and a lot of times, very wealthy people are very eccentric, and they have a tendency to spend ridiculous amounts of money on, on very silly things. Uh, like, you know, I don't know, gold-plated toilet seats or something like that, right? It's like, what? And it's been uh, unbelievable amounts of money on this. And, and so a person who loves money and a person who has much money, that's where it goes. It becomes very self-indulging. And if we don't have money and we love it, we live in a life of discontentment and, and covetousness and jealousy and bitterness and all of this kind of thing come out as a result of it. We need to completely let go of the love of money because it is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith. The definite article there in the faith is there in the Greek talking about wandering, those who wander away from the Christian faith in general. Those who longing for it have wandered away from the faith because they do not mix. They don't go together. We can't love money and love God. We're going to love one or the other, and therefore we've got to let go of one or the other. And to love money means to let go of the love of God, or to reject that. It's reminded me of Demas, and Paul mentions in 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is verse 10, he says, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. What a sad story. And the last part of verse 10 and pierce themselves with many griefs. <laughs> Why would we do this? We think that it's going to bring happiness. We love money and we pursue it and we're able to acquire it that is going to bring happiness and all it brings is piercing ourselves with many griefs. That sounds miserable. Proverbs 4, excuse me, Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's sin. It looks good, it smells good, maybe even tastes good, maybe even feels good. But in the end, it leads to death. It's the way to death. And the love of money in, from Scripture is clearly a, 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 clearly a sin. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So which way do we pursue? Our own ideas, what we want, what we think is right? Or do we go, you know, I've got this thing called the flesh that I've still got to deal with, and uh, maybe it's not right. So let me seek the Lord. God, what do you want? How do you want me to live? Is this right? Is this not right? I want to, I want to go down the way of life, not the way of death. And we humbly go before the Lord and seek Him for guidance rather than do just what we think is right. The right way, again, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So when we're living a life of actual biblical contentment, seeking the Lord first, seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness, and living that out from His word, we can trust that God's going to provide the rest, and we're not worried about that anymore, are we? It's not something that we're consumed by. 
I'm not saying don't think about it anymore and go sit on the couch and wait for God to provide. That would be a terrible idea, and there's lots of scripture that goes against that idea. We need to be being diligent and being good stewards and working hard, but worrying about it is a completely different thing. And that's what we need to stay away from. We need to keep our priorities straight. Seek the Lord. Seek a life of righteousness, a life of godliness, and living that out, which He will help us do, and trust Him for the rest. That's true contentment. And we can do that because He gives us the strength. He gives us the satisfaction of our current circumstances, this contentment, to go through whatever it is He calls us to go through. And like Job, at least in the initial part of Job, and his response to it was like, you know, God's doing this. He can do what He wants, and I'm going to trust Him, and we're going to just going to work our way through this with the strength of the Lord to help me along the way. Let's be truly content in how we live our lives. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we just thank you so much that it's not about how the world says we should live as pursuing wealth and pursuing material happiness and all those kinds of things, where it's really at is peace and joy and contentment in you. That no matter what this life brings, the life that we have to look forward to doesn't even compare, as Paul said in Romans, doesn't even compare to what we, the hope that we have in you and what we have to look forward to is so much better. Let us have an attitude to endure now, but not gritting our teeth, but being satisfied, trusting and considering it joy as we go through this life that you've called us to live, even with its trials and tribulations and persecutions and all that comes along with it at times. Lord, I thank you that we can trust you. You have our best in mind. You are working all things out for good for those who know you. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.